All right, so I wanted to get together to talk a little bit about some of the stuff you were working on within compliance. I read through the issue a little bit yesterday um, and the compliance framework you're putting together, which is cool. Uh, and I want to understand how things um, should or should not overlap within the plan stage. So sure. um, there are certain things that are coming up as I'm talking to the larger companies that around um, enforced workflows would be one of those. Um, even something as simple as like um, multi-level approvals and merge requests, uh, but mainly they said in issues to verify and before they will accept the issue from the engineer uh, that it is behaving as expected and to not let merge requests get merged until that happens. So I did a demo yesterday where I showed how you can kind of do that within a merge request sort of with manual steps in, uh, in a pipeline and then also the current behavior of uh, merge request approvals. Um, so that's one item that seemed like it overlaps with compliance a little bit because some of the reasons why they want enforced workflows are compliance related. Uh, as in like they need to have their legal team review every piece of user facing copy or content that changes before it can be published, that sort of thing. Right. Um, and then the other area of topic is this custom fields. And there are lots of use cases why people want custom fields on everywhere in GitLab, pretty much. Yeah. Uh, some of them are for auditing. Some of them are for compliance purposes. Some of them are simply to track uh, like what piece of hardware a given project is running to, on or assigned to. Um, and all the way down to people want custom attributes on issues to track certain data and fields that we don't currently have in GitLab. Um, and some of them are compliance related and some of them are not. <laughs> so there's like a lot of overlap there and I'm not sure like how to approach it. Yeah, so all of that makes sense to me and fits in with the theme of uh, when you target enterprise, you necessarily target you know, that or have to satisfy those compliance requirements and those compliance requirements are gonna be varied uh, between each org because each org writes their own policies that dictate how they behave and then they're audited against those policies. And so an auditor comes in to company A, says, show me what you say you're doing for software development. They say, oh, we do these 10 steps. They're like, cool, show me you actually doing those things. And then they go to company B, but company B has 36 steps. And so they get audited, uh, more thoroughly. Uh, and so they're, they're trying to make their lives easier by having GitLab provide that customization aspect through custom fields to say, I want to have all this data here because it's easier for me to track for my internal audit program. Um, but that doesn't make it any less challenging. It just makes it understandable. Uh, and so that being said, the reason we went the path we did on compliance labels for projects was because a recurring theme uh, in the compliance mindset is I have these processes I need to enforce. Uh, the simple example that's often cited is like, I need at least two people to approve any change at the merge request. And so we said, okay, well, let's make that our first iteration. Let's give you some of those merge request approval settings at the instance level. Uh, and so then we did that and they said, well, this is too broad because I don't need it for all of my projects. I just need it for the regulated ones, but I don't want to have to manage it at the project level. And in some cases I don't want to manage it at the group level because this is like an organizational policy. So we said, okay, well, how do we refine this? Um, selecting projects doesn't make sense necessarily because if you have hundreds or thousands of projects, then that's also tedious. And so we thought, well, let's, maybe introduce the concept of compliance labels. And so by labeling their projects, uh, we're doing feature parity with the API, projects API so they can do that programmatically. Uh, you could then say, I wanna enforce these settings for projects that are labeled with any framework or maybe even just specific frameworks, uh, maybe even eventually have like a profile per framework. So that's the path we went, but I think that's a different problem because we had a very narrow focus um, in terms of how do we reduce the blast radius these policies so that it's not just nuanced details we want to track for each step of you know an issue or a merge request or a project um, and we want GitLab to give us the flexibility to create those custom fields to 
append that data. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. So I think, I mean, I mean, what are your thoughts so far on that? I mean, do you, do you see overlap or do you see them as these divergent paths? Uh, I see them as a, like uh, overlapping solutions with different use cases, right? Yeah. Where I would like to see one under like, like one solution on the back end solve many jobs. Um, and I think like looking at labels, that's where I've kind of seen that is a overlapping solution to lots of problems, but it's almost to the point where we relied on it too much now that it's, uh, we're going backwards a little bit and taking the most, uh, the biggest use cases for labels and converting them into first class like fields, like uh, an issue type, for example, or uh, um, like we want to eventually get towards different workflow statuses, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Is it like a first class thing? Um, so I think that's where like there is some overlapping solutions and especially with the idea of like compliance labels and now we have topics which I didn't know about until that not too long ago when I inherited projects. Uh, and then we have this custom attributes API that will let you set custom attributes uh, programmatically but it doesn't service them in the UI anywhere. So I, I bet somebody contributed that to solve the problem <laughs> that they needed. You know, um, yeah. so like I want to figure out how we can not have to maintain a bunch of different technical solutions, but then also cleanly apply a common, common primitives to solve all these problems, more or less. Yeah, I think just kind of spitballing a bit. Um, the reason we didn't use topics was because you can't really, there's no enforcement mechanism. So like if I go in and I add a topic and I say PCI, uh, somebody could come along and remove that. Uh, there's, mm -hmm. as far as I'm aware, there's no audit events for that. And there's no way to programmatically apply it under some criteria, like on newly created projects or things of that sort. Um, maybe via API, I guess, but that requires custom work on their end. But I think that the custom attributes feature, if that's what I think it is, um, maybe that, and I think you mentioned in Slack as well, like maybe that deprecates topics and we run with that and we present it in the UI. Um, and I think even if we did that, my opinion is the compliance framework label would still exist, but then the custom attributes would allow customers to refine further. So like you could maybe say, okay, this is a uh, socks project that we label, but then we use the custom attributes field to say that uh, maybe the more like compliance technical way would say, let's label it as section 400. And then that tells their internal systems and team that that has certain requirements. Or you could even use custom attributes to say like separation of duties or two person approvals. And then based on those custom attributes, they can maybe manage certain workflows, but then so could we. We could say like all projects that have this separation of duties uh, custom attribute, we can maybe trigger certain actions or behaviors off of that, which makes their compliance journey easier. Um, that's just a rough thought. Yeah, the other the other area is kind of like there's been requests to have protected labels, which would more or less, uh, unless you are a certain person, <laughs> you cannot add or remove labels from an issue. And it goes back to the same thing of allowing anybody to just like add fields or if it was a topic, anybody could change that. And I think I wasn't sure how to approach that um and, and make it like an optional thing but it is sort of like where there's a recurring theme of there are certain things within GitLab that people want to restrict from being editable or changeable unless it's a certain person not a role but a certain person um or set of people and i don't know the best way to, to approach that <laughs> really um because it feels like overly restrictive and, lo and locked down um but i also see why you know in larger companies you would need that too yeah, I mean, do you do you think that do you think that if it was something available via like a service account or API that they could build themselves that it's not default behavior we permit or provide but they could build it to be restrictive in that way through some other mechanism as an op as an option there or do you just not like the idea period? Uh, it's not that I don't like it. It just, it adds a lot of complexity from like, if I'm an engineer working on an issue board and I want to drag an issue like from one board to the next, right? Like we would have to throw an error that doesn't let them do that. Or if I want to go and select an issue from a dropdown, we would have to either not show it or make it not, 
you can't apply it and explain why. Um, just those sorts of like complexities to that like further restrict, I think, the whole thing we're working towards, which is how do you enable teams to move quickly, autonomously, and uh, embrace DevOps to increase cycle time. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I, I wonder, I mean, maybe maybe this doesn't solve the complexity issue, but I wonder if rather than preventing everyone or, or uh, allowing only certain people to make those changes, if you, like, if we could build in a mechanism that if I, if this label is somehow identified as like hard coded for this issue and it gets removed by whomever, uh, maybe then it just gets reapplied automatically, kind of like a built in GitLab bot type of thing, but I don't know if that solves the complexity issue that you're referring to. Maybe, maybe not. Um, I think that's one area. The other one uh, is the custom fields. The reason why I haven't wanted to build it yet is the governance behind it. And I don't want to uh, get to the point where like you open, which I've seen in a lot of our competitors through our customers demoing them to me, like littered with a bunch of like fields in the sidebar or somewhere that never get filled out and nobody uses them and nobody knows what they're for or why they exist. And there's not like, so if we build custom fields, this is where like, I would want really um, tight audit events almost like on the custom fields themselves. So I could see who changed it, who added it, why, uh, how many issues it's currently being used on or where the data is populated. And then like um, almost like an owner of somebody who's responsible for that custom field. So that anybody's like, why are we using this? They can go and say this person's responsible for this custom field and why it's there. Talk to them if you don't like it, <laughs> you know. Um, and then being able to set certain rules on that, like this field has to be filled out all the time, or it doesn't, or you know, I think this is why we've lost a lot of deals to uh, competitors within Plan is because we don't have custom fields, but it's a messy thing. Yeah. I mean, I definitely, yeah, I, I, it's one of those things where I side with you because I, I mean, I don't personally use custom fields across feature or tools I've used in the past. I find that like the, uh, you know, a great product will have what you need at your disposal and like custom fields is really just tailored for like that very specific workflow that the enterprise customers have or well, it doesn't have to be enterprise. But being that enterprise have that need, um, it, it does fit that theme of what I'm dealing with on a regular basis where if you know three or four customers say, I need the ability to do X, and it, it's kind of this like customization type of thing, then there's inevitably gonna be another handful of customers who say, yeah, that's great, but I need it to be tweaked in this ever so slight way because the way that you're proposing it doesn't work for me. Um, but I think it's a bit simpler, relatively speaking, in this case, because uh, like I think we know what the solution more or less looks like in terms of, well, we just need to provide customization, like these custom fields. But I think it sounds like what we're getting, uh, where the biggest challenge is, is then the complexity of that on the back end, primarily? Or is it like yeah. a UX thing, is it both? The UX thing in the back end for custom fields is easy. Like if I were to want to add custom fields, it's the same thing that way custom attributes work, work right now. There's key and a value mm -hmm. and you can specify what the key is and then you can fill out the value. Like that's what a custom field is. So technically that's not hard, but it's the whole ongoing life cycle of managing custom fields and understanding why they exist, who's responsible for them, how they've been changed, how they're currently being used. Like that whole governance piece to make sure that like uh, you don't end up with this like, weird set of all of these like data points and custom fields that you don't know what to do with. You don't know how to migrate them to, or get rid of them. You don't know why they're being used some places and not others, if that makes sense. And so that's like the yeah. big complaint that I hear from a lot of Atlassian customers this year is like, we've, we've, uh, we've tweaked our setup of Jira to the point where it's so messy that it's unusable. <laughs> Yeah, so like let, let's just assume for a second that we're we're talking purely compliance, and this is like a collaborative thing that you and I are doing. Um, I would love to take on the governance piece because I think that even with like issue labels, I, I I'm not aware of a place I can go to look at who uh, maybe I can that that same governance info, like what 
what issues or how many issues is not a label associated with, who created it, who's maintaining it, when was it last used, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so for custom fields, uh, it's definitely, I definitely agree with you there that like if we could show some view that says, here's a list of all your custom fields, here's how many issues it's current, uh, it has some value on. So like maybe there's, you know, it's gonna be on every issue in theory, but then there's only like 10 issues where it's being used. Uh, you can say when that field was last updated on an issue, who created it, you know, the, the data that you're talking about. Um, because I think you could, it would achieve what you're talking about is like that pain point of how do we, how do we manage this to where it's not this huge headache. We don't lose all this um, sort of like tribal knowledge of who originally created these things. And now it's just a headache for all of us who have to inherit this. And we don't even know if it's necessary anymore. Um, but then from the compliance side, uh, for the organizations that are using these fields for compliance, you could then generate reports to say like of the last 10 releases, here's how many of these issues had these custom fields populated. And like you can maybe derive insight to say 80% of the time we're filling out all of these fields that are required. And you could then make that part of the compliance narrative. Uh, but then there's similar application for even non-compliance just to see like how often are we even using these things as a percentage or what have you. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, that uh, yeah, when we get to working on custom fields, which we plan to this year at some point, it would be great to collaborate on the the that piece of things and let you take the compliance part and the governance piece. Um, have you gotten much feedback as well about like enforced workflows or folks that who want to make sure that issues go through a specific number of steps or have a certain data that gets set on it? that sort of thing or is it largely been about merge requests it's lar it's largely been isolated to merge requests and the link to an issue so like the only enforced workflow that i've heard of is i want to make sure that this merge request has an issue that contains the business case for the change uh, and there's also a tie-in to things like service now so like is there an issue that describes the change is it linked to a change management ticket or change control ticket and something like service now and then the MR is that final gate before it gets uh, approved or merged into production. Um, so enforced workflows as you've described them is not something I've personally come across yet uh, but maybe I'm just not on those conversations. Yeah um, are you um, about linking MRs to issues we've talked uh, asynchronously a couple times about needing to improve like that what that means. Mm -hmm. Right, since you like related is not necessarily like implements or the canonical thing that is fixing the issue. Um, do you have that on your roadmap to address? Because if not, I was going to put it on mine to figure out as that also ties into release evidence and stuff that I've been talking to Jackie about. Yeah, um, it's not an immediate priority. Uh, I think the last interaction you and I had was uh, you had shared an issue where you were going to, I think you were exploring adding a field to. I think the MR was it the MR. Yeah, the MR sidebar and like having a, a field there that you could link the issue that corresponds to it. Mm -hmm. And then I think my my thought there was that would be a great first iteration. And then the compliance iteration would be let's allow that to be enforceable. So like you can't merge it. You, the group owner or admin could have a setting or something that says require that, that MRs for these compliance labeled projects have a linked issue in that field. Um, I don't mind if you want to take that on, if that's something that's a higher priority for you. I think from my perspective, I would just wait until that first iteration existed and then I could act on that. Okay. Um, the other thing is we're kind of nearing time and I'm thinking about, uh, I'll share my screen real quick just to uh, sure. go through a couple things. Uh, this is increasingly something we need to like focus on solving is this custom workflows piece. Um, where you would have more states than just opened and closed. And I thought through lots of different ways to solve for this. Um, but one of the things that I was looking at is we have this value stream analytics now where you can customize the stages, right? So you can name it and you can like specify which event. Uh, so if it's a label added or removed, we can probably add more event events. And then when it, it's, it stops. So what I was thinking about doing is figuring out how we can uh, extract this out uh, this customizing piece out of the, just the value stream report and have like a, you can define your custom workflows based on events um, that happen. 
And then within, if you want to get to the enforced workflow piece or like a more audible thing where you have mm -hmm. required fields, within a, a given customizable stage, you could say start event, stop event, and only like can only stop when like these other events have happened. So like issue eight added or a certain label has been added or uh, whatever. And then that way, like it would prevent the issue from moving into the next workflow stage until right. like, these events have been satisfied. And that seemed like I wanted to double check with you. I, I don't know how far we'll get in towards in terms of enforcing that, whether like we'll, we'll complete block or if that's just the thing that you can flag and put in an auto report somewhere that the event didn't happen. Um, Cause I don't want to be overly restrictive, but I also want to have clear traceability so that organizations can like have transparency and then talk with people who don't follow <laughs> their policies. Yeah. So I um, want to get your opinion on that. Yeah, my general thought is I would lean towards being less restrictive and just generate an alert uh, of some sort in a report in the compliance dashboard somewhere uh, because the merge request and all of the processes around that and like going from CI to CD uh, and all the different capabilities we have there, I think is more than enough of a gate to prevent something undesirable from getting to production or some undesirable change where in what you're proposing, I think if you take a more passive approach and just alert off of it, uh, developers or users can still maintain their velocity and they can still continue to work, but then management or, or the appropriate stakeholders can still talk to them with the assurance that you may not necessarily ship something undesirable. Now, if there is some condition in there where bypassing a state could lead to a change in production, then that's where you would want to take some stronger action potentially. Um, but that's just my, my initial thoughts on it. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. Thanks for that feedback. And I, I definitely, it'll be a couple of months before we start working on that. Sure. Um, but we kind of need to look for the large organizations that want, they, they kind of have said that um, they've used tools like eTollgate and I can't remember the other one for gated checkpoints. Uh, to let the, the the tool handle process enforcement so that people don't have to. <laughs> yeah. Right? Which which makes sense to a certain degree. It also is a little bit less humane. And so like I'm trying to wave my way through and be like, what are our company values? What do we want to uh, help other teams strive towards? Even if they currently think that they need like these things, can we show them a better way? And how do we yeah. do that? So it's it's been an interesting and complex thing to think about so yeah and, and i'll just um i know we're at time but last thought i had was on the the show them a better way is what i found with you know tackling a different project is that uh for maybe many customers that's possible and that's relatively easy to do uh, but when you start talking about compliance minded customers um you know, typically the people we deal with are not the people who write the policy or enforce the policy. They're just there to make sure that the, the policy is followed from like a day-to-day -day operational perspective. And so to convince them to do it a different or better way would require them to literally modify their policies. Uh, and that's just such a huge machine to move because it's internal audit that's probably legal, that's executive management and buy-in from their side to make those changes to policy and process. Um, so that, that's a very big uphill battle that if, if there's a way we can still meet their requirements in a, in a better way that doesn't actually change the intent of what they're trying to do, then yeah, like more power to us. But uh, if we're trying to change the intent in any way, uh, that's usually a battle we won't win in my yeah. opinion. Yeah. No, that's great. Great input and great feedback. Um, all right, thanks for sharing. I will uh, keep you up to date on how things progress within our plan stage, likewise. And uh, let's figure out, I'm gonna think a little bit further about the custom attributes and the topics and all that stuff and hopefully maybe come up with a proposal next week uh, sure. that we can start discussing. So uh, yeah. appreciate your time. Yeah, yours too. Please feel free to tag me on anything if I can be helpful in some way. Awesome, I really appreciate it, Matt. Yeah, take care. All right.